it's that time again. It's uh, for our next first chair chat. It's our first first chair chat of the fall semester of the 2020-2021 academic year. My name is Adam Laspada. I am your host for this first chair chat. Our topic for this chat is great ideas and lessons learned. We're going to be talking with several experts in the field of music education and how the current world crisis has affected what they do and how they interact with their students today. We're going to start off with April Prince, Dr. April Prince, <laughs> principal lecturer in music history for the music history, theory, and ethnomusicology department at the University of North Texas. Take it away, Dr. Prince. All right, y'all. It's uh, Thank you so much for this invitation. It's really fun to have the opportunity to talk about some of these issues. Um, I am going to share my screen and my computer sound just so I can kind of talk through some of the things I'm thinking about. Can everybody see everything okay? Looks yes. Good. Adam? Okay. All right. Um, I was... Uh, Let's see here. All right, I'm gonna minimize that. Uh, uh, in a, I guess before this pandemic, I had already started one of the um, goals, I think of my position at UNT, uh, was to begin developing more online courses. Um, I, so pre-pandemic, I had already uh, converted to music appreciation, which this semester with the pandemic has an enrollment of 350. I created Sounds and Cinema, which is a film music course, and this semester we have an enrollment of 200. Uh, and then Music as Communication, which was our original um, course that was part of the Provost eCore initiative uh, several years ago. Uh, and that's that has enrollments for majors. Uh, we have several teaching fellows working on that class now with up to 150. I guess I wanted to note that all of these courses are fully online and asynchronous. That means that um, I'm really not doing any uh, synchronous meetings on Zoom. Everything's kind of self-paced uh, by the students and I provide them with resources to help them do that. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of my pedagogical concerns, some of the ways I try to address them in online platforms, and then some of the uh, technological things that I'm trying to do in my classes to encourage uh, creative student engagement. Um, three of my main concerns, of course there are many, but with online teaching, one of the biggest concerns is the intellectual rigor and engagement. So making sure that um, you're engaging the students in a way that uh, demands a high level of critical thinking that is sometimes much easier to get in a traditional learning environment uh, and that you're also being true to the discipline within which you're in so that you're kind of trying to consider all of those things. I did some early online teaching or I guess my earliest online teaching was back in 2007 and eight, and that was the biggest challenges, the biggest challenge I encountered was really getting students to think deeply and engage deeply with the subject matter. Another big concern of mine was that I was wanting to try to create an authentic and of course fun online learning experience. I didn't want to just take exactly what I was doing in the classroom and put it online. I wanted to try to use the online tools that we had to create something dynamic and engaging for the students. And of course, perhaps the the biggest issue, and this is even in in-person classes for non-majors, is to create a learning community. So uh, that's something I'm consciously working on in classroom environments because non-majors come into the class not knowing one another. Uh, and so that's even more challenging in a 350 person class that's completely online. How do you get students to interact with each other and to interact with you? So I just wanted to address a few ways, uh, or show a few ways rather, that I address these concerns. Um, one of the most important things that I've learned about online teaching, and I will also say just as a caveat that the CLEAR, uh, UNT's CLEAR has been incredibly helpful and supportive uh, and given me lots of wonderful um, instructions and tips on, on online teaching and learning. And one of the most important things is to basically make sure that all of the expectations are clear. Maybe a more basic um, aspect, but that's something that, I've, that I do think is incredibly helpful and that 
not only thinking about broad-based course objectives, but also weekly objectives so that you're constantly kind of showing the students how the different um, learning objectives and assignments kind of fit together. Um, so I try to do sort of module-based or week-based um, learning objectives um, that connect specifically back to the different discussions or uh, challenges that they're doing for that week or overall assignments basically. And another thing just in sort of clarifying expectations, one thing I've done in online teaching that I think is very handy is all the due dates are standardized. They happen at the same time every week um, or bi-weekly or monthly so students kind of get into that groove of knowing what they're doing when and then they can always kind of tell uh, go back to the objectives to see explicitly how the assignments are um, integrating with those uh, with those objectives uh, in this semester i would say because i have a lot of students that haven't really self-selected for online um, but have kind of done that more obviously because of the pandemic situation. I do I have sort of more done more micromanaging of assignments than I have in the past. Um, as I mentioned, these courses are asynchronous. So there's a really a student paced content coverage. I create interactive course materials. I rely a lot on um, detailed reading guides that include lots of rabbit holes for further explorations. If a student wants to continue down a particular topic, I include lots of different extra listening. And then I also incorporate Panopto, which is a UNT based um, video system if I need to do something a little bit more detailed, in-depth sort of short lecture or discussion. I use that a lot in my cinema course if I'm talking about a scene or we're kind of analyzing that aspect. Um, as I mentioned, I also try to uh, create a consistent set of assignments that happen at a regular time. And I really, in online, have a lot of low stakes assignments. So every week the students are getting, um, they're engaging with the course material um, and that provides a lot of community interaction between students and me. Um, and then I often create high stakes assignments that are scaffolded. So trying to kind of get students to think deeper every time and they're getting a consistent feedback uh, from the instructor and from their peers. So just to kind of show you what some of those things look like in Canvas, um, this is a reading outline for sound and cinemas that I um, created for that course. Um, and one of the things is just to note I try to include extra reading materials, extra images or listening uh, throughout so that they can kind of go and explore on their own if they're so inclined as they're working through the material. Uh, so this is really kind of how I structure a lot of my uh, content, I guess how I get the content to the students. Um, and here's another example for music appreciation. Uh, so trying to include questions, trying to include um, articles that link out to genres maybe they're not familiar with, um, full albums, those sorts of things. And this is just an example of a low stakes assignment um, and the micromanaging that I've started doing where I give them specific things that they need to post, specific word counts, formatting guidelines. Um, so this is an example of sort of just a, a smaller 30 point assignment that they do every week. They can miss four, I think over the semester. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility as well, but really trying to get them to do a low stakes engagement with the material. <laughs> And this is just an example of the scaffolding. If they have a longer project, I typically break it down into a lot of smaller sections so I can keep a really close eye on what they're doing. Um, because sometimes, in, well, a lot of times in online teaching, if you don't have that kind of oversight, the kind of products are not as nearly as, as good as they could be. Lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about using creative online tools. Um, I'm a big believer in um, the democratization of creativity across non-major learning. It's something um, I'm really invested in as a teacher. Um, and I just wanted to show a couple of things that I've been using. Um, Soundtrap I have been using for several years now. It's just a free um, collaborative music making tool. I've used it for remixes, for podcasts, and I used it this, uh, this last semester and this semester or uh, some silent film projects and their music concrete project. And then Clip ClipChamp is another easy online video editing tool um, that I've asked students to engage with. Many students come into class with a familiarity with these platforms, but then many don't. Um, so they might have other platforms they prefer, iMovie or Audacity or other things that they're using that are more high tech. But these are just sort of basic free ones that everyone can really use. 
I wanted to show two different little projects. These are very short. Um, for Sounds and Cinema, they have a musical narrative they construct at the midterm, and then that helps them build their final scoring project uh, for their final, where they score a silent film from the Library of Congress. And the goals of this is to apply course terminology, really synthesize the materials over the course of the semester and to engage creatively. Um, so just wanted to show you two examples. Um, I'll only play the opening of this, uh, but just a student whose uh, musical piece was to illustrate a day trip to the beast. Just he created a sound narrative that did that vis-a-vis -vis sound. <laughs> So that's a really fun assignment to grade and gives the opportunities for students that might not use much sound editing to get, get a chance to engage with it. And then this is the culmination of the class where they uh, score a silent film from the Library of Congress, which are usually around a minute or so long. Um, I didn't include the entire narrative that the students uh, provided, but this is just a short example of that. <laughs> and I only require them to be about a minute. Um, so let's see here if I can stop sharing. That's really the uh, just some examples and some of the um, things that I think about in designing these courses. So it's really fun to get to grade a lot of those at the end of the semester when you'll they because they'll cho often choose the same video and do it in all different kinds of ways. So yeah, Adam, I'll throw it back to you. Great, thank you so much for Dr. Prince. That was. That was really enlightening and it's been very interesting to see how your courses have developed since the time that I was working with you as a teaching assistant teaching fellow. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten better, much better <laughs> every year, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's all a learning process. Yeah. Um, as Kristen posted in the chat, if anyone has any questions for our presenters while they're presenting or even after their presentations are over, feel please feel free to write them in the chat and uh, we'll unmute you and you can present verbally or type question. And, uh, ah, Morgan, if you'd like to present your question, go yeah. right ahead. Hi, Dr. Prince. Thanks for your uh, lightning talk or presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, I had a question about your rabbit holes. So I'm an instruction librarian, so I provide research support and I do a lot of one shots. So I'm not always able to get to everything. So I'm wondering, do you use the rabbit holes as kind of a supplementary thing or for things you can't cover? Primarily it's supplementary or it's to provide background information for a term that um, I'm, they might not know. Um, so for example, in music appreciation, I often get a lot of questions even about what the word composition means. So I often try to anything that, not anything, I guess, but if I'm, 
had the question in the past or even in typing it out, I'm like, oh, I haven't really discussed that this much. It's a, it's not a crucial part of the content, but if someone wonders what that is, here's a quick way for them to figure out what it is. Um, so you're right. It, it's mainly supplemental for students that want to listen more or kind of learn more about a particular topic. Okay, awesome. And is there any sort of grading that's attached to it or is it just for your own, you know, pleasure and joy? Exactly. So it's okay. more sort of student incentive. Um, but I do, I mean, on the flip side, I, I already asked them to do, I think, a lot of graded interaction. And so some of it is that those are um, more sort of free. I do have opportunities where for extra credit, I'll have provide sort of an interaction and ask students to comment on it. Um, but yes, for a lot of those, they're just sort of a more free opportunity. Awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Great question. Brian? Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Prince. And I, like, as you know, I've seen a lot of the things yeah. you've done. And I tried to do them myself. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the kinds of resources you link and how that intersects with copyright. Like, I know uh, Wikipedia, we can link through our classes and there's no questions asked. And I always go back and forth because I want students to have information, but I also, you know, if I'm doing something that could be interesting, I hate to just have 15 Wikipedia links on my page. And I was wondering if you had any other suggestions for uh, kind of good places to go for those sorts of resources. Well, where, so what are you using? As, I mean, I use all kinds of resources, I guess, library materials, Library of Congress materials. I think there are, there are copyright concerns. And when you actually, in Sounds and Cinema, the copyright lawyer with Clear actually went through and timed every single YouTube example I had in my course to make sure it wasn't, because it could only be a certain length of a certain film or so. So that actually got really in depth. I would have to cut clips or choose other examples. Um, so that is a very, a real concern for video, YouTube and videos. Uh, for images, the copyright, is pretty free if it's, you, you know how you can go on, what I usually do, if it's an image from the textbook that I'm having students buy, I use those images freely. If it's an image that I'm getting off the internet, I typically go to Google and make sure that I choose, when I'm searching images, I choose free use or creative Commons right. kinds of thing. So I do really try to keep the copyright issues in mind because Clear typically goes through your courses every couple of years. And so you wanna make sure you have all of that in order. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess for the rabbit holes, I do a lot of, I mean, depending on the course, for example, there's all different kinds of blogs about film music by film composers themselves. So linking to their sites, linking to their works, linking to interviews with them um, in music appreciation, their composer, com uh, composer diversity database, I link a lot to for, for students to find particular things or even the databases of different orchestras around um, the United States. So I really do try to diversify it, but I also use Wikipedia too, if I'm trying to okay. find or just a genre or something like that. Right. Um, but I really do try to make it like worth their while. So if they do actually click on it, it'll be something interesting and fun um, and not just always a definition. All right, thank you. And related to the content too. So it's something usually that's pretty, can be narrow or broad. Yeah, Brian's a teaching fellow with the music history department and does a really wonderful job and has a lot of experience in online teaching too. All right. Well, thanks, y'all. That was really fun. Thanks. And Dr. and Dr. Prince, I'm sure you wouldn't mind if people emailed you questions for Oh, of course not. Yeah, please. I'm always happy to chat about teaching. I love it. Great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Great to hear from you again. We move from April Prince, uh, experienced in classroom teaching, to Gabby Alvarado, 
flute instructor who has her own private studio and who is my fellow graduate services assistant here at the music library. So I will turn things over to Gabby now to talk about her experiences working with her flute students during these times. Thank you, Adam. Um, yeah, so uh, as Adam was saying, I'm the graduate um, service assistant uh, in the music processing unit. Um, in addition to being a doctoral candidate, I maintain a flute studio for the past about 15 or so years. And my students range from um, fourth grade all the way to graduate students. Um, and I also, um, maintain a very active performing career um, during throughout the country with um, various chamber ensembles. So due to the nature of my own career, I have had some experience teaching online before the pandemic hit us. Um, and I had set some fundamental structures to my lessons that were somewhat different to what I would do in any in-person teaching that I do. Um, however, I was not involved in online education to the magnitude that I am doing now. So once the country shut down in March and all of a sudden I need to accommodate 60 private lesson students of all different ages, and different backgrounds, and per, um, performance level, and of course, different um, with different accessibility to technology. Um, then I sort of had to not only help them transition through that change, but also figure out very quickly um, what I could use and what could I not use in what was going to be my new normal for an indefinite time. Um, I would say the different um, experiences that I've had in my career have definitely um, helped me adapt to stressful situations and to think on my feet. Um, and I think this has come super handy during the pandemic. Um, today, I just kind of want to share with you some of the things that I did like, from the beginning and where I am today, um, like six or seven months into um, online teaching full time. Um, so one of the first things that I did, of course, was assess the tools and the resources that I already had and figure out how I could use them um, to the to the best of my ability. And that was not only um, technology tools, but also, you know, access to the library resources and the resources that I have as a um, doctoral student. So just everything that I had in my hand. Um, and then I spend some time getting to know the technology devices that I already own um, so that I can utilize them to with the best results. And it's always handy to have students uh, to have friends who kind of want to help you out to try out things with them so that you don't try out right away with your students. Um, the third step in um, my transitioning was definitely, um, and this is an, an ongoing task, and it's really learning what every platform is um, offering to me and how how does that change from you know from platform to platform because some school districts and the community college that I teach at in um, Dallas offer certain things that might be different for example in in Dallas we we use Webex and Blackboard um, uh, for for the streaming of the lessons and we have that's, that has completely different settings that you would use for zoom or for facetime or skype so i kind of had to learn what every single platform had to offer me and how i can adjust that to my t-tank um then again i just making sure that i didn't get in trouble with the institution that i was working for um but always thinking about how I could help my student to the best of my ability. So I also started tailoring my teaching based on what results I was getting. 
Um, and with that, then I started changing the way that I would normally teach them. And I started at assigning them recordings like to record themselves not only is, is that a great tool for them just to learn from a very early age in their career but I've, I just feel like sound gets so affected and distorted by the Wi-Fi connection and the quality of your connection that sometimes I was not always able to hear what was happening during the lesson but with recording assignments, I was able to get much more information of their progress throughout the week. Um, so like April was saying, their um, recording assignments were always on the same day, due on the same day every week. And they had worksheets that I designed specifically for them to the recording so that they were tailored to, um, well, for me to, to know exactly if they were learning the concepts, but also for them to, to learn what to listen for as they were practicing. Um, and they also had weekly um, practice logs that they need to fill out and turn in. Um, no matter whether this was my grad students or stuff, I just kind of wanted them to um, learn how to structure their time and everything that they were doing since everything was now so different. Um, I started to be much more conscious of accessibility, not only because my students um, range in age and performance level, but also they're from different socioeconomic backgrounds and access to the internet and technology devices was so different. Um, and sometimes just compatibility between, you know, um, a PC against like a Mac product is like so different and and how that affects what you're hearing um, so trying to play and adjust and adapt every time and trying to see um, how the student can be best compensated for the time but also in their education um, I of course learned a lot about my own teaching and I noticed that I relied a lot on um, demonstrating and that doesn't always come across um, through online teaching. So my language changed a lot in my teaching. Um, I also learned that lighting is super important because when you want to demonstrate fingering or even embouchure, you need to make sure that um, the light is actually in the right place. Um, so. Um, I know people find it funny, but like I have one of those influencer lights um, right in front of my face all the time so that my students can actually um, see when I demonstrate. Um, and uh, one of the tools that I, that I created for my students and was I pretty much created a digital library, right? So I used a lot of um, Google um, Drive to kind of storage everything that they need whether it's all the exercises that I designed for them or things that are um, that normally will be accessible to either at their band library or just even at the, at the music library at their school, I had to have them all in one place, especially back in the spring when nobody was able to access any of the campuses. Um, and then from there, I also uh, learned how to advise my students whether it was just to like walk them through and every platform on how to choose their audio settings, their video settings, and so on. Um, from telling them not to put their, their computer or any kind of the um, device that they were using um, during their lessons on, on a hard surface, because if it's hard or metal, um, we get a lot of feedback. And so I would just hear more of the feedback than what they were actually playing or um, how the distance from the microphone would influence what I hear. Um, and of course, make them understand that sometimes we just have to adapt because technology is not always on our side. <laughs> um, and that's pretty much what I have for you today. If you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer in more detail. Um, thank you for your time and for having me today. Thank you so much, Gabby. This was great to hear. And ex the ex your experiences as a private instructor and I was especially interested to hear about your light and how important um, lighting is we ex we've experienced this so much in zoom meetings everyone's been in zoom meetings but that's something we often overlook um, 
in terms of we think so much about sound as musicians, but lighting, as you point out, is so important as well. Does anyone have any questions for Gabby at this time? Dude, this is Kristen. Um, Gabby, I had a question about um, whether you've noticed specific age groups um, do better or worse with remote learning than others, or if there have been specific challenges within different age ranges. Um, it hasn't been so much with age ranges, but more with personalities. Like something that I was noticing. Um, and especially more now that half of my students are like back in person school and all the, the other half are doing still so your learning is some of them are just kind of tired. You, they are exhausted of being in front of the computer. They're not used to it, you know, and the younger they are, some of them are um, happy to be on the computer because they love video games. Whether, you know, that doesn't matter what gender they are. They just kind of love being in screen. But the older you are, I feel like, you know, like your vision gets tired and then you just kind of want to be doing some other stuff. Um, the one thing that I did incorporate in all my lessons was movement. So all of my students have to stretch every so often, like either at the beginning of the lesson, the middle or at the end, because I do think that they spend so much more time now just sitting and not moving. Um, so if they have been sitting for a long time, they would do their lesson standing. That's like something. So that was part of like the beginning of the lesson I kind of check in on what they're doing what they have done throughout the day and of course it really depends like for example today I had a 7 a.m. lesson um, it, the treatment to a 7 a.m. lesson is going to be very different to somebody who's been in school all day and has their lesson at 5 p.m. Um, um, I think it definitely changes more than with age I've seen changes with personality there um, all of my very introverted students have really enjoy doing their stuff online and they're um i want to say suc succeeding like they're really really just like showing a lot of progress but some of the more extroverted people are just like really suffering from the not having that social connection um with their group with their band um or just like being outside and doing more of what their normal life would have been thank you so much gabby yeah of course Thank you very much, Gabby. At this time, we're going to switch up the order of things just a little, and we're going to move to Dr. Eric Nestler, Distinguished Teaching Professor of Saxophone at the UNT College of Music. We will have our pre-recorded video by Blair and Chris at the end of, doc after Dr. Nestler's presentation, if anyone wants to stay while we're on for that, you're certainly more than welcome to do so. But now we're gonna move to Dr. Nestler. Thank you, Dr. Nestler, for joining us today. Thank you, Adam. I'm very happy to be here today and thank you for the invitation. Uh, the topic of discussion for today is the great ideas and lessons learned and teaching music online during a pandemic. And you know, the reason that I was asked to come here is because during the summer, I teach a woodwind literature and pedagogy class. And in fact, Gresha, I see you. And Gresha was in my class a couple of years ago and did marvelously well. And she could probably tell you all the dirty details about the class. But um, I, I think I need to back up just a little bit. <clears throat> At UNT, I teach saxophone, classical saxophone. And so I'm always in the studio teaching and and getting an education from Dr. April Prince. It's I was a little overwhelmed at all the, the things that I have absolutely no idea about technology. And uh, sometimes I feel like I'm a techno idiot. Back in spring, you know, when COVID hit and all of a sudden we had to teach everything on Zoom, I remember talking to Warren Henry one time and he asked me, do you have a Zoom account? I was like, what? I had never even heard of Zoom before. And I, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, neither did he, but we got a steep learning curve really quick. And, you know, for a, a few weeks, it, you know, it wasn't terrible teaching uh, private lessons that way. And I was thinking forward, oh, oh, we had to cancel all departmental recitals, you know, all, all programs were canceled. 
which kind of breaks my heart, but that's kind of the way it was. And, uh, but now we have some recitals being offered through streaming. In fact, I gave a recital about a month ago and it, I gotta tell you, I don't think it was too bad. You know, I played for an empty room, but I still took a bow as if people were clapping because I knew there were people watching. So I tried to make it as professional as possible. But we also have department recitals, which were canceled in the spring. But in the fall, we've been doing all of our department recitals in saxophone via Zoom. And actually, they're actually pretty good because I can give clinics using instructional videos. Now this brings me all the way back to the summer class. So in preparation for this summer class, I thought originally, oh, COVID will go away by, by May. And boy, that was a, a pipe dream. And then all of a sudden we had to teach the, the class via Zoom. And I remember also telling Warren Henry that I don't think this class could ever be taught online. Um, and then because it's really a bibliography class and all the students are really required to go to the library physically and, and touch not just 10 sources or not 20 sources, but we're talking about hundreds of, yes, yes I see you smiling, Gracia. And then they have to do annotations of those sources. And some of them are etude books, but a lot of them are pedagogical books and history books. And you have to just kind of open up the source and page through it and find what's interesting. So, you know, this, the, the student that I would see would be typically either junior or seniors and then grad students. So the problem I faced when COVID hit was how am I gonna teach a bibliography class that requires physical presence in the library without actually going to the library and touching all those sources? And so my first plan was, okay, I've got a pretty big library of my own and I can start scanning sources. And then the library staff, many of whom I'm, I'm looking at right now are fabulous. And you guys scan sources like crazy. Then Donna Arnold told me on the first day of class, well, you can go to the library now, but you really shouldn't. And then I thought, well, I'll tell you what, I'll be the only one to go to the library and I'll scan all those sources. So what I did after I taught the class, I would spend the, the two hours at a time and just scanning sources. And I think, boy, I don't know, hundreds of sources, we have hundreds of sources scanned now. And um, that turned out really well, but we were talking Dr. Prince about the copyright issue. You know, you can't scan entire source. I think the rule is, uh, you can do 1% and a 10% or one chapter, whatever's less. But, you know, sometimes the interesting stuff comes later in the book. And sometimes what's interesting to one person is meaningless to somebody else. So that's kind of a negative thing about it. On the other hand, um, I can show the sources to everybody quickly online without having to leave the comfort of their own home. And, you know, many of the people are in different states and even different countries who are now taking this class. So, um, you know, one of the positive things that I really enjoyed about the class is that before COVID, it was a little bit like a performance. People would stand up in front of everybody and make a presentation every day. On uh, using Zoom, they can still do that, but they, they can turn their video on or sometimes they don't. And it's a lot less like a performance than I think when we're in front of people, but it's still, I think still kind of a positive thing. So the, the most important tool I think for the class, but not just the class, but also private lessons is screen sharing and, um, Gretchen may remember this, I spent years scanning my entire library, which I have on my iPad. So no matter what a student chooses to play, I've got it and I can pull up the piano part and we can study it. Now, after this past summer, I've got nearly all of the sources that we looked at on my iPad. So I can just zoom into a particular spot and screen share 
And if there's a particular page that I want a student to read, I can go right to that. And that's really a kind of a positive thing. So that's the bibliographic part of the class. Then the other half of the class is pedagogical techniques. And so I was thinking, well, how can I make this class really beneficial to students? And I thought, well, I'm, I'm locked up at home. I might as well just start making short little videos of myself playing the saxophone and uh, the flute and demonstrating concepts, skills, and uh, even acoustics. And then when it came time to uh, introducing a particular topic for a week, I would always start with a little video clip that I just used my iPhone and took a video of myself demonstrating something, maybe the overtone series or perhaps how to do vibrato on saxophone as compared with flute. And then I started thinking, you know, I've got students in the class, they could make videos for me. So uh, for instance, uh, Grecia, I had one of the clarinet students demonstrate overblowing twelfths on a clarinet, and which is different than the other woodwinds. And then one of the bassoon students demonstrated something else, and they all enjoyed doing that too. So the, these are the, the really the positive things about the class. And I suppose the, the big negative that still kind of remains teaching this class uh, using Zoom is that it's the physical walking over to the library, going in the elevator to the fourth floor and getting lost in the stacks. And that's the thing that you know can be the most beneficial, searching for a call number that is difficult to find and finally you get it in some other part of the library that was in the reference section that you might think was in the regular stacks. And you know that's an education in and of itself. And then I suppose, you know, one thing in talking with one of my students about online classes and, and remote classes like this is there's a little structure that might be missing uh, that, you know, I hate to say this, but I'm when I was a freshman, I had to go to a class at eight o'clock in the morning and get out of bed and, and go across to another building. And students don't have to do that anymore. And they could just kind of wear their pajamas. And, and some students I think need structure to succeed. And I think I kind of do too. Uh, so I've, I've gotten pretty good at creating a, a structure for myself to get through the day. And But not all students are able to do that yet. So one of the clinics I gave earlier this year was how to create structure and use time management to your best uh, abilities. The bottom line is I felt teaching remotely is hugely successful using using Zoom. And because I've got all of these sources on my, my iPad, uh, the technology is just very helpful. The one thing is, you know, the social connection that you would have with students and students with other students if they're sitting next to each other in the class. So that's my little talk. Any questions? Thanks, Dr. Nessler. You're my pleasure. Your, your uh, many years of experience has been invaluable both to your students and we really, we at the music library have very much appreciated um, your use of all the resources we have. You've uh, been an, a huge proponent of, you know, throughout the years, the many things that we've had to share. And we thank you for uh, continuing to use our resources for the benefit of your students. Well, I'm hugely appreciative of the library staff you guys got me through this. Mm -hmm. I, so two thumbs up from me. And Donna comes to the class every, you know, the first day of each class and gives us an education on how to use the library. And it's just wonderful. So thank you. I appreciate all of your help. You're very welcome. Does anyone have any? Yes, thank you to Donna. And thank you to uh, our music accesses, access service manager, Blaine Brubaker for um, helping facilitate this transition from uh, in-person to online learning for not only for Dr. Nestler, but for many of our uh, faculty members in the College of Music. It would not have been possible without you guys, not at all. So mm -hmm. I'm in your debt, as are all of our students. Indeed. 
does anyone have any questions for Dr. Nestler? Dr. Nestler, um, the, the, as we we all have a, an optimistic attitude about COVID and of course things won't remain like this forever. So I was wondering if there are any strategies you've acquired during this pandemic that you'll maintain once we return to sort of a in-person instruction in a more normal pedagogical atmosphere. I like I like the instructional videos on my part to, to, to share with the students and because it's already done and in the can I don't have to worry about you know how I'm going to sound on a particular day. The second thing that I really like is you know with remote teaching uh, Gabriella mentioned she had a 7 a.m. student every day well Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday I, I teach a 7 a.m. student because I've got three students living in China who couldn't get out and come to class. So I'm teaching them before their music history review that starts at 8 a.m. So keep in mind, it's 13 hours ahead of us there. So when I'm teaching 7 a.m., it's 8 p.m. on the other side of the world. And what I have found that works very well is I ask them to prepare all of their assignments and record it. Then I play their recording during the lesson and provide my ideas. And with the, the use of the, the screen sharing with my iPad and the music, I can, I can draw on the, the music and elucidate certain points, either compositional techniques that are being used. And that's really a super powerful tool, I think. So th those are the two ideas. That's great. Brian Anderson, uh, go right ahead for Dr. Nestler. All right, thank you for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about what you found as maybe the benefits or the limitations of Zoom and instrumental lessons. Um, you mentioned having people record and send things to you beforehand. And I was wondering uh, how much live playing have you uh, experimented with over Zoom and how has it gone? Yeah, well, that's the thing. So in the springtime, that's how I did it all was live playing. And, you know, all of a sudden there would be noise and, and then the noise would come back again. And uh, so that was very, for me, disheartening. So I often we did, we did have them play. I did have my students play, but I spent a lot of time studying the score and doing theoretical analyses of pieces and, and showing that to students. And then when it became apparent that we were still gonna do some remote uh, teaching uh, using Zoom, I, that's when I decided they need to do total asynchronous. So now with the students that I see at 7 a.m., they'll have everything recorded but if I wanted them to, to try something, they will, and it will go over Zoom. Um, our, some of our Woodwind faculty members, especially Dr. Palavianga, has some good ideas about Zoom settings and using microphones. Um, and I think that might be successful. Um, but you know, different people have different resources available, available to them. Not everybody can get the best mic or have the best electronics at home. Um, so now, you know, I'm teaching face to face with the exception of, of those three students. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you again for allowing me to, to address today's class. Great. If there are no more questions, uh, we thank you very much for coming, Dr. Nestler. At this point, we will be showing a pre-recorded video from Blair Lycala and Christopher Walker. And I will turn this over to Kristen now. 
who will be uh, showing this video. Now, because this is a pre-recorded video, uh, Blair, neither Blair nor Chris are here to answer questions in person, but that's okay. Kristen will be happy to field uh, questions for on their behalf. And Blair is the Director of Recording Services for UNT. Christopher Walker is the Administrative Coordinator of Jazz Studies. That is who they are, and here's a little bit about what they do. All right, I want to thank Christopher Walker and Blair Lycala to join us today. They are, were unable to make it due to a pre-scheduled meeting that they had, but we thank them for coming anyway to speak with us about technology related to uh, the online music education under the pandemic. And so I would like to start with uh, Christopher Walker. Um, we noticed that in a one of those COVID-19 updates that we were getting almost daily in our, April 16th, um, you were recognized for your tireless work helping faculty in the Jazz Studies Department provide the highest quality online instruction possible. And that had to do with, um, you know, according to that recognition of distributing equipment. So we were just wondering what type of planning was involved with that? How did the ideas come about and what were the logistics? It sounds like it was probably a huge task. Sure. Um, well, up front, I'd like to say that it definitely was not just of me or my faculty. This is more in concert with other parties across the College of Music, in particular, Scott Krejci, who's our staff manager of our um, College of Music Computer Lab, um, who was already in the process of getting a lot of equipment and whatnot for general college-wide um, needs and services and whatnot. Um, and I'll also kind of admit that part of my help in the implementation of this and me remaining um, partially on campus from the onset of the pandemic was a little bit selfish in that I wanted to just maintain a campus connection in some way. And so I, I wanted to find a, a, an avenue in which I could remain um, that partial essential designation so I could just come visit my office occasionally and whatnot. But then I got to uh, uh, then levy that into uh, helping to deliver some equipment both to students and faculty uh to complete the transition that two-week transition that we all made into remote delivery um with what we are all becoming localized experts in of, of network speeds and uh basic fundamental uh, baseline requirements of um what it kind of takes to pull this off um we we leaned back a little bit on what we kind of already knew of um, what what would be good microphones, what would be um, good video equipment that wouldn't cost either us or um, individuals that much money uh, to implement. And then when we're uh, encountering, as we often do in public education um, environments with disparity in needs and resources, uh, we were also then trying to maximize or maximize our our resources to serve those that couldn't afford any of these resources on their own um, and get them temporary loaned out solutions such as small road microphones usb microphones um, or even um, zoom not the zoom uh, platform that we're on now but zoom the audio company that makes little recorders and now little video devices um, to, to allow for better video as well Excellent. Um, how, about how many students did you distribute these items to? Do you have any idea or is it kind of all a blur at this point? I kept a, yeah, no, I had to keep a, a, keep a spreadsheet because I wanted to make sure we, you know, we're keeping tabs on all the equipment that was going out. Um, not only just the uh, webcasting materials, but also some things like keyboards and amps and um, other hard and, and expensive equipment that obviously we weren't going to be using on campus, but we were comfortable with um, doing uh, managed loans and whatnot. Um, we distributed for students uh, upwards of maybe 35, 35 individuals, upwards of two or three pieces of equipment each. Um, 
and then including the faculty that I that I worked with in that same regard, it was probably upwards of 50 or 55. That's a good number of items and people to keep track of. Definitely. Yeah, it kept me busy, it kept me roaming around Denton in the external Denton cities, <laughs> delivering and, and picking up and everything else. And and occasionally, you know, for some students that ha that went all the way home outside of the state and whatnot, we also did some shipping of, of equipment, of oh, very wow. small equipment out to people as well. Okay. Wow, that's that's excellent. Um, and have you continued this as you've gotten maybe a new batch of freshmen in, or is it sort of stabilized at this point? Not, we haven't had to do it as nearly as much, um, but we have done some. Um, out of CARES Act funding, out of um, some supplemental reallocation of resources uh, here within the college and locally within Division of Jeff Studies, we did um, towards the end of the summer get some more uh, equipment of our own management. Um, and so we've, I, we probably have maybe a half dozen small webcasting pieces that are out to students right now. Um, students to their credit are very resilient and uh, have fashioned a whole manner of their own uh, solutions to things. Um, but then we're also faced with uh, certain need, ongoing needs of faculty that are in high risk groups um, who have not re returned to campus at all. And um, while the solutions that we came up with in the spring were okay for the remainder of those uh, eight weeks or so of that semester, um, something for another 16 weeks of, of uh, delivery required some a little bit more thought out planning. And so we've, we even have things now where we have individual, I'll give a, a setup. So we have jazz chamber music, which is um, small groups of students' performances of which separate to all the technology side, just the sheer amount of logistics of being able to make rehearsals happen and uh, accounting for aerosol dispersion and timing of things and whatnot. Like that's, that is an ongoing big part of our entire equation. Um, but we have these uh, jazz chamber groups. They rehearse in a, in a room three times a week, two with a faculty coach, one uncoached. Um, but then some of those faculty coaches are not on campus. And so how do you coach something effectively when you're not there, especially in a potentially compromised uh, thing like uh, the Zoom or, or other meeting platforms? But we found some technology technology pieces, um, such as the, uh, again, the audio company Zoom, Zoom Q8 cameras uh, that have really good webcasting uh, codecs or uh, drivers to them. Um, so you get high quality wide angle uh, video and audio uh, in near real time. And um, it's it's actually worked out a little bit of like having a remote coach, but still interacting with eight people in a room for 30 to 50 minutes. Um, it has worked out thus far for nine weeks. <laughs> That's really neat. Goes. I've uh, I've wondered about those, those Zoom um, camcorder recorders, you know, about the quality. And, and so it sounds like they're working pretty neat. Yeah. Well, Thank you, Christopher. Um, yeah, so Blair, uh, I've heard that you've been really enhancing the streaming services, you know, of course, out of necessity and in the amount of rooms where we've, you've needed to add cameras in, in performance venues. Can you speak a little bit about what you've been up to? Sure. Uh, so we, we've been live broadcasting concerts since about 2009 out of the Windsor Hall and We've gone through several upgrades over the years and tried to expand and, and whatnot. And so this, this past year, we added cameras to uh, five additional spaces. Two of those spaces have multiple cameras. The other three spaces just have single cameras. And that's in addition to the Windsphere that has uh, a camera system. And so part of what we were trying to solve over the years is trying to uh, meet the scale of what the College of Music has in terms of numbers of recitals to the number of staffing that we have. So instead of trying to manually start and manually run all of these events, uh, we're trying to find a way to kind of um, fix all of the bottlenecks we had in, in terms of that manual labor so that it's, it's an automatic thing. And uh, as far as cost, trying to bring the cost per event down as much as we could. So it's a combination of getting cameras physically here, the switchers here, 
uh, we had to renovate a, uh, an office space into a control room to give us uh, a place to put a lot of that hardware and a place to mix the cameras uh, together. And then uh, the web platform to be able to get it out to people so people knew where, where to watch it uh, and do that kind of in a, an efficient way so that we could we have options to use YouTube or use uh, a service or use internal uh, based on what the event was and all of that's happening under the hood. So now we can essentially live stream out of those halls all of the concerts that we do in the College of Music. The, the concerts are recorded with video, we edit them, we put them online, they can download them, they can post them, uh, whatever they need to do. So it kind of meets requests that we've had over the years to do it. Uh, and to meet that that level of video production, uh, it just happened to be when a worldwide pandemic happened. So, kind of shoved it, <laughs> gave it a push off the cliff to get it to happen so quickly. So. Blair, you, you yeah. barely lead when you're talking about scale of what we do here in the College of Music as far as number of recitals and concerts. How many is that? Thank you. Thanks for asking that. <laughs> we we went from about sixty ensemble events that we broadcast to about six hundred. At a zero, the college puts on about 1,100 events. We stream and, well, historically, we've recorded about 600 to 700 events. Uh, we may end up doing more now, but uh, as far as what we're required to do for accreditation and um, faculty concerts and normal concerts, it, it runs about 600. So it sort of sounds like this is, um, in a way, how you've set it up automated is that fair to say or do you have like a huge team working under you you know making sure that everything is going smoothly for every single concert or is it sort of like all set up and ready to go once people are playing uh it's a little bit of a little bit of, of both i mean it, the the process of of streaming a recital is uh, fairly automated we have student workers that run. So I run about six to eight student workers and there's another full-time staff member just in the recording end of things. And we have other production staff that help with stage and, and lighting. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a small team. I wouldn't say it's heavily experienced with student workers. We have business majors, we have accounting, we have science, uh, we have obviously music majors. Um, so the, the level of, of technical competence is, is more on the beginner level. So we couldn't roll something out that had a, a large number of steps to do or um, they had to know how encoders worked or how response codes worked and, and how the website worked. They just had to be able to walk in and hit the fewest number of buttons and options as possible to make it work. And uh, if it had an issue, they knew what the issue was enough to call me or the other staff member to jump in. And so we needed a mostly automated, but still it's run by someone who's physically there, okay. uh, who can frame the camera up, who can uh, watch to make sure everything's working correctly. They still have to be there to edit the event afterwards. Um, but all that said, the whole system is fully remote controllable from home if we, if we needed to do that, which we already have once. <laughs> wow, that's super neat. Um, so Blair shared a website with me earlier where he's written this up in more detail and we'll share that now in the chat and um, I just really want to thank Blair and Christopher do you have either of you any last things you want to share or before we leave or do you think we're good to go here um I will I will use this as a small pivot point like we're talking about the way that um things are working here in our academic setting and whatnot which are important but you know we we produce music majors to then go be musicians and professionals out in the real world. And while the real world and, and professional music making is is um, doing a lot of these same sort of things of, of finding ways of live streaming and whatnot, uh, the real magic is of course in live events and, and audiences and whatnot. And while we wait on um, medical and civil society to figure things out, um, in that regard, I will just pull a small plug here in um, promotion of NEVA, uh, the National Independent Venues Association, and their work of the Save Our Stages Act, um, which is looking to similar in like the way the CARES Act or anything else is, is provided um, subsidy and direct assistance for um, 
a large facet of, of American life in compensating for pandemic times, the Save Our Stages Act is going to be a very strong lifeline to the thousands of independent and small stages that really make up the meat of the live event industry. Thank you very much. I did not know about that and we'll definitely find the information for that and get that also shared out in our chat, in our live chat. All right. Well, thank you very much, Christopher and Blair, and thank you for everything that you're doing for the College of Music students. And um, I really appreciate your time in doing this chat with me. No problem. Thank you. Hey. Have a good one. Thanks for sharing that video with us, Kristen. And again, thank you to Blair and Chris who shared their expertise and knowledge in absentia. And thank you all for coming to today's first chair chat. Uh, we again apologize for our interruption. Thank you for sticking around through that. Um, again, if anyone has any questions for Blair and Chris, please email them to Kristen. Uh, take a look at those links that Chris provided in the chat. Please go especially to that last link. Um, remember that live music is especially still so important in these times and uh, musicians thrive on live performance. Um, thank you so much for coming to today's chat. Remember, we're going to have more chats throughout this semester and the academic year. We thank you for coming. I am Adam Laspada, your host, and have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.